Nick Lober is an author, entrepreneur, and founder of SideHustleNation.com, a growing community and resource for aspiring and part-time entrepreneurs. As the host of the top-rated Side Hustle Show podcast, Nick explores a different business idea every single week and helps listeners discover the path to new job-free income streams. Hey, Nick, welcome to the show. Tom, thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. It's great to have you. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get started with online marketing? With online marketing, my original side hustle was a footwear comparison shopping site. So back in the day, before you would just go to Amazon to do your product search, you would go to Google and you would look for, uh, you know, price grabber or next tag or something like that. And so my theory was, well, I can build, uh, instead of trying to be everything to everyone, I can build the uh, footwear specific comparison shopping engine. And it was a, it was a good business for quite a while, um, but eventually had to shut it down. But so that was the that was the original side hustle. That was the vehicle that let me quit my job after three years of nights and weekends of trying to make that happen. And it was uh, that was kind of my uh, learn that was my quick <laughs> trial by fire education in in online marketing and uh, in online business. Very cool. So was that free Zappos? Zappos was one of my biggest uh, advertisers. Um, Shoe Buy was really big at the time. There, I mean, there's a dozen of these different stores. And so we'd smash all their catalogs into one database and try and spit back out the best price for each uh, model of shoes. The problem was that business, it played in the margin between the cost of traffic, which was primarily AdWords. Um, it never, never got a lot of SEO love, never got a lot of organic love. And then the the value of that traffic in terms of what commission you could earn. And so in 2006, 2007, 2008, like that was a pretty, that was a pretty big gap. And then over time, like the commissions kept getting cut and the, uh, and the cost of traffic kept going up too. So had to shut that thing down in, in 2014. But by that time had started a couple other side projects on the side from that business. And most of those, failed or most of those kind of like died a quiet death in the corner of the internet but a couple of them survived and uh, one of those was the side hustle nation uh, blog and podcast mm -hmm. that's awesome so let's dive a little bit deeper into your entrepreneurial journey because i think you're one of the guys who's you know you've tried so many different things online and that, that level you should just share with your shoe company that's a great example of what happens when you have a great business you're making profits allows you to quit your job and all of a sudden you start to see your sales going down every month, your traffic going down every month, and you start to realize, hey, this thing's not really sustainable, right? Yeah. So for other folks who, who find themselves either wanting to start a business or they're in a business with that kind of, that kind of situation happening, how, how, what did you stay focused on day in and day out to kind of turn things around? So part of it was trying to really dive into the 80-20 of what was driving sales. And so we found that... Um, well, only, so there's like 500,000 products in this database. Well, only 100,000 like ever get any page views or something. So it's like, well, we could dramatically cut our processing burden if we could narrow down all this stuff. We could dramatically cut down like our ad spend if, you know, the top 50 brands account for 80% of sales and stuff. So that we worked on that for part of the time. Um, we did, you know, really cut back on stuff that wasn't driving results like, you know, blogging really, really never did anything for us. But on the side of it, it's kind of like the writing is on the wall and we, you know, what are you going to do to diversify? And there were some months where my virtual assistant started making more than me and it's like, ah, oh, this is not, this is not a good situation. So we, or I guess I just, you know, was, was fortunate enough to have, you know, to have the systems in place that it was running without needing a ton of my time. I mean, it still was like a full-time job, but like there was time built into the day or into the week to play around with other projects. And so that was really helpful to have something to fall back on, have something to diversify with. Um, because, you know, you never, you never know what it's going to go. Actually, it was the first day, like I'd, I used to work for Ford and while I was building the shoe business and I turned in the keys to my company car and I'm like, all right, I'm, you know, I'm going to be a full-time entrepreneur and I've got like the visions of the four hour work week and the margaritas on the beach, like going through my head. And on day one, like first day of self-employment, like fire up the laptop and Google is like, your account no longer meets our quality guidelines. And we're like, dude, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, you think it's some sort of, you know, mistake. Like you have no problem with this account the last two years 
And oh, by the way, like I just quit my job. So you go through the, you know, seven stages of anger and denial and, you know, all this stuff. And it, it took them three months, it took them three months uh, to reinstate the account. And they finally sent me an email. It looks like we made an error. And it was like, I used to have hair at that time, you know, it was just kind of a crazy, uh, crazy stressful time, but it was, it really hammered home the point of, you know, diversity of traffic, diversity of income streams and, you know, not having all your eggs in one basket. So I, I thought it was diver- diversified because there was 40 different advertisers on the, on the store, but it, or on the site, but if you peel it back one layer, you know, 80% of that traffic came from Google. So I was like, ouch. Mm, gotcha. So, so tell us about your business today at Side Hustle Nation. How do, have you diversified your traffic? You bet. So this uh, is not reliant on Google AdWords, um, but it, it probably gets half the traffic from Google. Uh, a lot of the traffic comes through email. A lot of traffic comes from referrals from other sites, from doing podcasts like this. And um, the other pie is kind of the social stuff or the, the standalone I guess, type in traffic, like it's become a little bit of a brand in itself. So a, a decent chunk of the traffic is, is coming that way. And on top of that, the, the podcast and it kind of, it stands alone in a way that the, the shoe business never did, whereas very much reliant on, you know, on the paid search um, stuff. So I'm, I'm not saying that it's going to disappear or like it could get struck down at any moment, but it's just, it seems to have built up a much, a much more solid foundation. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So, you know, a lot of times we get this conflicting advice as you know, entrepreneurs, creative people that, you know, we need to focus on our strengths on the one hand, on the other hand, we need to diversify. How do you kind of find that balance in between those two? I'm like the worst person asking about this. Um, Cause I see people who, you know, have really focused on, you know, one particular side business or one particular business model. And, you know, they've gone off to the races, you know, they're building, you know, multi six figure businesses, where in the meantime, like, I'm dabbling in all these different things and like, you know, trying to trying to make it happen. Um, it, it, it is a balance to strike. And, and maybe it's been fortunate for me to start this, the side hustle nation brand where it's like, well, now I have an outlet for all these like creative experience or experiments to try and uh, try and build that into a larger business uh, than they would be individually. Uh, I don't know, like, how do you stay focused on, you know, your, your publishing company and stuff like that when there's, there's so many different things you could try? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's tough. It's really tough, man. <laughs> it's like, it's like I have to kind of have, so I have what's called thinking time. So every week, at least once a week, I'll sit down with a pen and paper and notebook and ask myself questions, which is like, you know, so for business questions would be like, you know, how do we increase our income? What should we be focusing on? Like, what are major projects to work on? that kind of stuff. And I find that having that focus on, okay, here's the next project we're going to do uh, is, is like crucial because okay. when I have 10 projects I'm working on at a time, I feel like I just feel overwhelmed. I feel like there's not enough time to get things done. Yeah. And also it's like, you know, stuff falls through the cracks. Whereas if we have one project, like, okay, we're going to get this one thing done and we know it's important because we compare it to everything else. And it's the most important thing for the next 30, 90 days or whatever. I find having like that major priority helps me at least stay focused on, something that's actually going to make a big difference long-term versus something that's just going to either fall through the cracks or only be successful for a year and then not be successful after that. Have you found anything particularly effective to, you know, stay committed to that thinking time? Because it seems on my calendar, that would be the first thing to go if I'm (laughs) deep in like editing a podcast or like, I got to write this thing or I got to, it's like, I'll, I'll do that later. Or I could do that, you know, after the kid goes to bed or something. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I schedule it in my calendar for sure. So it's like, it's in my calendar, like 9 a.m. Monday or, or whatever time it is. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of that same mentality, like with a doctor's appointment at 9 a.m., like you're not going to miss it. You know, okay. I'm going to keep so this appointment. Kind of having that religious, like adherence to, okay, it's in my calendar. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, I think that's just kind of crucial. I like that. That's, that's something I could definitely get better at. Like we do, it's hard to take, take that time. So that's a really, um, that's a really cool habit. Thank you for, thank you for sharing it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, I, I know you tried a lot of different business models and business ideas and, and I have as well. I mean, I remember before I ever became an author that, well, at least a published author, I had tried at least 20 different things online, 20 different projects or websites or blogs to try to make money. Yeah. And they basically almost all failed. <laughs> So tell us about what, what are the things that you've tried? What are the things that worked? What are the things that didn't work? And what were like kind of the biggest lessons you learned through your journey? 
Sure. So, so the shoe site worked and kind of as the next iteration of that, um, I tried uh, to build a sandal site. It was like, I can get even more niche and do sandals. And that was, you know, just had I thought about it, had I scheduled the thinking time, you know, probably would have realized like, I, you know, that's, you know, a lower priced product. It's really seasonal. It's, you know, duplicated content with the shoe site. Like it just, like there was a lot of reasons why it was kind of not the best move in the world. Um, so the next move was to create like a handbag or luggage site because a lot of the advertisers I was working with like also sold handbags. So it was kind of a natural extension. And because the comparison algorithm technology and stuff that we already had in place, like it wasn't crazy expensive to develop this new site, but it was still like five grand, I think. And it never broke even. It was just a much, um, you know, again, had I had the thinking time, had I had the time to really research that market, I would have found that, you know, you know, the naming conventions for luggage were all over the map. So it was really hard to write a string based comparison algorithm. The commission rates were lower already and all sorts of different things. Like they're the breadth of uh, retailers was like 10 times wider. So you're churning through, you know, way more data just to try and pick out, you know, the 2% of the catalog that's actually relevant to the site. Um, so those are the products. And actually I tried to start a wine related site. We kind of live like in California wine country, not, realizing at all that like I don't care about wine I it's just it was a site that I had really had no business uh trying to write and people for that reason there was no reason for people to really visit it was all like me too kind of not spun content but just like there was nothing really unique to go there the whole purpose of it existing was trying like get an affiliate click and I was like this is this is dumb and so the sites that I've done that have that have been more successful you know, are the ones that I'm really like, okay to stamp my name behind and say, you know, right from the first person and say, this is my experience. This is what, this is what I found that, you know, where you can, where you can do videos and like, you're not, you're not ashamed to like put your face, uh, you know, onto the site and just, you know, having the time to, to do the homework and do it right has been, has been helpful in getting some of these other projects off the ground, I guess. Um, and that's just like the niche site website game or the affiliate site game. Um, but I think it goes to, you know, freelancing and it goes to self-publishing and it goes to online courses and it goes to selling stuff on Fiverr. Like there's a lot of different stuff out there where people try and be anonymous and, you know, the stuff that I've had that's been more successful is like where it's really been like, no, I want to do business with Nick and maybe that's maybe that's a point of distinction between the failures where they're just like trying to be this anonymous site that hey, this could be written by anybody. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So you really think the key for your success has been like building your personal brand and really connecting with your audience in, in a, in a deeper way than just hey, buy my stuff on this website. It has been in site and really the, I thought of myself as a blogger first because I've been running this like personal blog uh, for several years about, nonsense topic like there's no co no consistent message or any reason for people to stick around and read it um but when i you know kind of rebranded as side hustle nation it was you know i definitely thought of myself as a blogger first but then it was the podcast that ended up taking off or ended up you know being the the primary growth driver and that was really surprising to me because i was just kind of started as an experiment costs less than a hundred bucks to get started. And I was just like, okay, let's, let's put it out there and let's see what happens. And it's become kind of my main, my main focus and the main avenue of discovery for, for new people coming into the, into the fold. And I think it's a lot more valuable than somebody reading, you know, a blog post and skimming it for five minutes. It's like somebody's going to spend, you know, half hour, 45 minutes with you in their earbuds week after week. Like that's a, that's a pretty deep connection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, then it sounds like you're doing, you've done tons of experiments, right? Like the podcast show, the blogs, the different businesses. Do you have like, like, are you just like a really creative person? Like you just have tons of ideas and, and you just have to like, you know, figure out how to try them out. Like, like what is kind of your, you know, there's like kind of like visionary versus integrator role for the, for the entrepreneur. It's like visionary is like, you know, you have tons of ideas, maybe not so great at implementation, whereas <laughs> the integrator is like, you know, you're just really good at getting stuff done. Where do you kind of fit on that spectrum? So I've been on both sides of this and I don't know if 
like I've been kind of in, you know, at low points, you know, like if I only had that one idea and, you know, you Google business ideas and you find these ridiculous lists and you, you, you kind of are in this point of desperation. And then what I found is once you get going on something, even if it's something you don't necessarily see yourself doing for decades to come, all of a sudden, all these new opportunities and ideas like start to pop into motion. One of my guests, uh, Ryan Finley, who runs a, he, he makes a full-time living buying and selling stuff on Craigslist uh, and runs a site called recraigslist.com. He says the best opportunities aren't visible until you're already in motion. And when he said that, this was a couple years ago, maybe almost three years ago, I was like, that sounds like pretty hippy dippy stuff, you know? But since then, I really recognized it to be true because you know, it's the conversations that you have. It's like while you're working on uh, certain projects that you, you know, out of your peripheral vision, you see this other stuff come up or, you know, somebody kind of plants an idea in your head that you never otherwise would have happened or you never otherwise would have had. And it's been kind of really powerful to see, you know, picking what's next doesn't necessarily mean picking what's forever and, you know, trusting, <laughs> trust, trusting that that is true and saying, well, I may not be uh and i, I may not be 100 percent married to this idea but i'm going to trust that it's going to lead me somewhere good mm, absolutely that, that's really insightful i think you know when i look back on my career you know when i published my first book all i knew was kindle like i mean you know i just uploaded on amazon kindle as an ebook and then now today i mean we've got print books we've got audio books we've got physical audio books like in costco and other retailers we've had books translated in other languages and published in other countries uh, like we've had all kinds of things, like online courses that I've created based on books. So like at the beginning of the idea was just, I'm just going to publish an ebook. You know, it was just this simple basic idea. And that one thing led to so much more. Yeah. So what, what was the first book you did? The very first book I did, uh, today is called rules of the rich. Um, okay. back then it was called rich by 22 when I wrote it, I was like 19 <laughs> when I wrote it. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but now it's, today it's called rules of the rich. So that was the very first one. But um, the actual first one I kind of like wrote, like before I published it was actually one I wrote with my mom called it's now it's called Dr. Corson's top five nutrition tips. And at that time I was like blogging about health okay. and but that was basically like what people would get when they sign up for my newsletter was they would get this free report and we yeah. would turn that free report into an ebook. Okay. Yeah. Cause you had all the smoothie stuff for a while, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, so. I mean, I think that's a great lesson for folks to learn is like, you don't have to just do one thing and be, have it be that what you do for the rest of your life. Cause I thought, I thought the shoe thing could have been it. I was like, Hey, this, I, I'm going to ride this out. This could be my thing. This could be my business. And then, you know, through lots of ups and downs is like, okay, this, this isn't going to last forever. You know, no business has kind of an infinite life cycle and there's some that, you know, survive for, for decades and centuries, but uh, other times it's, um, uh, it's a lot briefer. I think somebody was like, Oh, you know, half of the fortune 500 wasn't on the fortune 500 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot of turnover here. Mm, definitely. So when do you kind of know it's time to move on to something different or something new? When it's no longer exciting, when you, when you dread working on it, <laughs> like those are kind of red flags for me where it's like, you know, this is not, and, and I think that's a different point than, when you're kind of in the pre revenue stage of like, okay, if I can just get this ramped up, if I can just get traction, like that's, and if you can get to that, if you can get to making money faster, I think you'd be motivated to keep going. But if it's, if it's on a downhill slide or you just don't like the work anymore, then there's really no point in continuing doing that. It's like the last thing you need, especially as a side hustle, the last thing you need is a second job or second project that you really hate. Yeah, definitely, man. So, um, with the podcast show, what are some things that you've done with that that you think made it kind of take off or was it just, was it just the kind of thing where, you know, you just tried something new and it happened to work out or were the things that you did that you think really helped set it apart and help it grow so fast? It's really, and it's really been a long, slow climb. So I don't think it grew fast at all. I've seen other people like have shows that really took off much quicker, but a couple of things were working in my favor one was consistency like putting it out uh week in and week out um the second thing was 
you know, having awesome guests with awesome stories and then trying to put on my marketing hat to say, well, what's the, what's the hook? What's the takeaway? What's the, what's the clickable title uh, for this episode? Because I've, I've done shows where it's like, hey, Nick, your episode is live today. Thanks again for joining me. And then you click on it and it's like 36 Nick Loper. You're like, that's, that's it? Like, who's going to click on that? Like, I don't even want to li- listen to that. And people who know me don't even want to listen to that. So it's just a weird, uh, a weird thing, like putting the, you know, the what's in it for me um, front and center, because that's, that's how I actually have a, uh, you know, podcasting and I actually got off to a kind of a rough start because I clicked on some link, probably from Twitter or something, you know, with a compelling sounding title. And I was like, it sounds awesome. And then I remember being like physically upset that it was, uh, that it was audio. And it's like, you're going to be, I have to figure out how to get this MP3 file. You know, the, the golden nugget that you promised in the headline was like 40 minutes deep into this MP3 file. And like, I have to figure out how to get it onto my device, like pre smartphone and all this stuff. But once I did it, like once I went through those hoops, I was like hooked. I was like, this stuff is awesome. And so I think even if it's, you know, the initial experience might be a little bit frustrating for new listeners. It's like, if you can get them into the fold, like, man, they're going to be fans. And so I, I still listen to that show like six years later. So it's just, it's a powerful, it's a very sticky thing once you can get people uh, in the door. Mm, that's a really good point. So it's, it sounds like you also have a, a big passion for podcasting, right? Because you listen to so many podcasts yourself. So it's not just like something else that you tried because like you heard people were making money with it, but something you actually have a passion for too. Well, the passion has developed over time. It definitely started out as like, it, you don't, please don't go listen to like the first 50 episodes. Like they're really, they're really rough, but it's a kind of this, you know, this practice of learning a new craft, learning a new skill, and then seeing results from it and getting feedback from listeners. Like that was really rewarding and it's kind of fun. It's become my art. It's become, you know, a little craft of trying to, you know, what to cut and what to keep and how to, you know, make this a really tight listening experience. And I don't know, it's, it's super fun to try and do that and, and try and pull out the stories and try and craft um, an episode. And like, I'm doing a fraction of what like the NPR style, like highly produced shows where, you know, they got 10 different, you know, people coming in and out and music and all that stuff. But, you know, try to do that on a small scale and, and really, you know, be conscious of the listener experience is, I don't know, that's, I don't know, that's been, that's been really fun. And I guess the surprising thing is, or the surprising benefit of, or the side benefit of it, has been developing this really worldwide network. I mean, we've had um, meet. I've been able to meet listeners like in Vietnam and in Japan and in Europe, and it's and, and all over the states. Like that's been kind of like the really cool, <laughs> really cool part of it. Yeah, totally. So, how did how do you improve that listener experience? Like, are there practical, you know? action steps you've taken to kind of make your show higher quality in some regards? So a couple things trying to be, you know, editing out stammers and ums and like all that negative space, right? So you can compress the length of it and say, well, that's going to take me an hour, but it's going to save, you know, 60 seconds or 90 seconds on the listeners end, multiplied times thousands of people. Like that's going to be, you know, paid back to you in in fold, hopefully. Um, But really, you know, it's been a, it's been a process of trying to get to the meat faster, uh, you know, cutting the long rambling intros and like, well, tell me, you, <laughs> it's like, uh, summarize that. And, you know, we'll, here we'll cut into the straight to the meat or like, welcome to the show. Like all that stuff has been cut over time. And it's just kind of been, um, you know, fun to play around with. I'm trying to think of what else. So I, I'll, consider it kind of like the listener pyramid, you know, converting strangers into listeners, listeners into subscribers and subscribers into fans. And, you know, so part of that is like the discoverability, you know, are people going to find you in iTunes? Are people going to find you through social media? Are people going to find you through Google or Facebook groups or whatever? Like that's kind of like trying to answer the discoverability, you know, finding these strangers aspect of it or appearing on other shows. Um, and then, you know, converting listeners into subscribers, what's been really effective has been creating these episode specific opt-in offers or episode specific lead magnets. Like, Hey, we talked about, um, how to sell courses on Udemy. Um, but you know, we, and, and the guests like dropped a ton of knowledge, you know, really tactical stuff, but Hey, you look, you don't have to take notes. We did it for you. You can download those show notes over here. And so that's, you know, exploded the email list. I think when I started that 
It went from you know a thousand subscribers to three thousand subscribers in three months, and then to six thousand subscribers within six months. It really kind of started. Um, that was the tipping point, or that was kind of a, an inflection point on the on the curve there. Um, and then from subscribers into fans, like this is now you've turned an anonymous medium into a medium where you can communicate with people through email, not just through the podcast, hoping out that like people have it on their phones and stuff. And so that's a way to build another, you know, a stronger relationship, you know, in a different medium. And it's like weird stuff, kind of taking a page out of the radio playbook, you know, with consistent segments of of the show and you know you'll we you will do the famous five or we'll do the fire round or whatever like the lightning round you know stuff like that but it was uh, you know that's what they do on radio where it's um you know consistent segments every of the show every morning and so i try and do that with with the language that i use with the music that i use like there's just the structure of it and i don't do i don't do a lightning round or something but it's like hey you know we wrap up with your number one tip for side hustle nation and it always it says hustle on at the end. It usually starts with like, what's up, what's up, Nick Loper here. Um, so it's just kind of these like little verbal ticks that, you know, people start to kind of latch onto. And people will send me emails, uh, you know, they'll sign off hustle on or they'll, hey, what's up, what's up, Nick, and stuff like that. So it's kind of fun. All right, that's really cool. So you've kind of created this own, like your own like languaging around, you know, how you start the show, how you end the show, right? And like a lot of folks do, like, like um, it was like Fire Nation, right? Is the right. One. Right. So like that kind of languaging, but like, is it, is it cheesy or is that stuff like, does it actually work to, to connect yourself with your audience? I think you, it's <laughs> a good question. It's kind of cheesy. Um, but I think it works too. I think there is something because like you feel like you're part of the tribe, right? You feel like hey, you, you know what's coming. There's some familiarity in that. And who like, you ever listen to the fizzle show? No, I've heard of it. But I haven't listened to it. Yeah, it's been, it's been a long time since I listened to it too. But they they are excellent at it. Like with these inside jokes that just like in every episode, and they're they're always like, man, I hope this isn't somebody's first time listening because <laughs> they're always like, you know, referencing you know these weird you know personality quirks and like these weird. It, it's it's really funny. Like if you've been listening for a long time, so there's a balance because every episode is also going to be somebody's first time listening. So you don't want to like alienate people to the extent. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but like throwing in those kind of verbal consistencies or, or something like that, I think can help, you know, it's a comforting familiarity thing. So I don't know, that's one, that's one thing that I try to do on top of the consistency of just, you know, publishing something good every week. And I mean, there's been some episodes I've had to scrap too. And so it's like, this didn't really do it for me. And so it's like, and there are, there are a few that slip through the cracks that I'd love to have back. Um, it's just trying to be just you know put the listener experience yeah so i think that's such a great point is like you have to have some kind of quality control on the internet right <laughs> like like it's really easy to just you know interview someone and publish it or to write a blog post and publish it and at some point you have to kind of say hey like if i really want my fans to stay with me here i've got to i've got to set the bar somewhere right and everyone's yeah. got that different kind of bar but I found that the folks who don't set the bar don't often succeed long term. And it becomes like each week it grows, it becomes more and more stressful too. It's like, I got to hit send on this newsletter. It's going out to how many thousand people? Like that's, there's a lot of pressure. You don't want to send out a dud. And sometimes you, you'll see it was a dud in terms of the open rate, in terms of response rate. And you're like, all right, back to the drawing board next week. Yeah, definitely. Well, that, that's, that's good that you, you constantly raising the bar and that you, Right. And, and you always have that kind of anxiety, like without thinking anxiety is like a bad thing, but when you're anxious to deliver value to your audience, I think that's when you, you do like you drive yourself to do more and more for your audience. Yeah. So I did this survey earlier this year and like the last, you know, stuff like how did you find side hustle nation? Like, what do you, what type of business are you working on? Like how much are you making so far in your business? And at the end was like, and if I'm being totally honest, one thing that you could do better or one thing that you do that sucks or like so it was something i forget how it was phrased but it was like some sort of like criticism and man people like opened up in here i was like yeah this is painful to read but it was like dude your voiceover guy is obnoxious i like every time i i love the show and i keep like turning people onto it but the first time that here's like this crazy cheesy voiceover guy you got to get rid of him or like your audio quality is horrible and stuff like you know so doing you know, there were some specific changes that, that came out of that survey. So um, occasionally helpful to uh, swallow your pride and ask for some, uh, some honest feedback on that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Good advice for sure, man. 
Well, Nick, where can folks find out more about you and the work that you're doing? SideHustleNation.com is the home base. And of course, you can find the Side Hustle Show for new part-time business ideas wherever fine podcasts are sold. And that's, uh, that's it for me, man. Awesome. Well, thank you, buddy. I appreciate your time and all the great wisdom you shared with us today, man. Hustle on. Hustle on, baby. <laughs>